Hi, I'm Lane from Cisco. In today's video, we're going to be talking about RFC 2544. Uh, this is part one of a two-part uh, series. The second part, we'll talk about how we need to revisit it in the context of high bandwidth and high bandwidth systems and high bandwidth ASICs that are available on the market now. So just brief background, um, what is an RFC? Uh, an RFC is a request for comments. It is the standards process as well as documentation process for the Internet Engineering Task Force. The ITF is one of the many standards bodies that control Internet and also data center standards. So um, in order to interoperate with each other, for example, uh, over the BGP routing protocol, you need to follow the appropriate uh, RFC. Um, 2544 is probably one of the, the best known because it's referred to by name, uh, not just by people involved in the standards process, but also by um, lots of people um, buying and consuming and, and deploying the equipment. Um, it was originally written in 1999. It did build on an earlier uh, RFC, as you can see um, here, uh, 1944. Um, Scott Bradner and uh, Jay McQuaid uh, were the, the authors. Um, my contention is that the RFC as it is, is it has some use, but it also needs to be viewed a little bit skeptically with regard to um, how do you interpret the requirements, especially in the ways in which it's it maybe no longer measuring the most important factors that we, um, we want to be concerned about. So there are multiple different parts of the RFC all around performance. Um, for example, there are some on, on latency and, and things like that. The one that people are most familiar with and the one that I'm going to talk about today is around uh, lossless packet forwarding performance. And so the idea is you want to understand uh, how many packets can I send without the, of, of different packet sizes without them, them getting dropped. If you go back to 1999 and... I guess I'll admit that I was part of this uh, this, this business back then. Uh, we were um, having routers, many routers deployed, um, even the largest routers at the time, only forwarded five or 10,000 uh, packets per second. Um, everything was kind of new. We we're still sort of figuring out how to do things quickly and, and efficiently. And so there was, I think, uh, if you read through the between the lines or, or sometimes actually just read the lines in the RFC, um, it does seem that there was some gamesmanship and specsmanship around the claims people were making. And so this standard sort of came out as a way to uh, maybe keep uh, keep vendors or keep, you know, uh, people honest uh, and, and do some type of testing. And so um, what they propose is that we're going to test some different packet sizes. So these are the packet sizes that are proposed. Um, they're going to be sent at different rates and we're going to search for the uh, rate in which no packets were lost over a period of 60 seconds. And that's a little bit of a, of a challenge in that um, it does mean that buffering can impact the results, but we'll kind of look, look past that now. Um, the packets were, are, are different sizes for different protocols. Um, all we really care about these days uh, is, is Ethernet, but at the time, uh, Token Ring, FDDI, another other protocols were there, and they had different um, packet sizes that they were, were using. So this is just a kind of a quick look at what an automated test might look like for a given packet size. So let's say we're going to start with the 64 byte packet. And you can just pick some number. And if you get a, um, a Spirit or an Agilent or some open source Ixia type tester, um, they will run these, these tests for you. So let's just say what's going to happen is um, it's going to start off by sending these 64 byte packets at 50% of line rate. So this is really mapping into whatever a frames per second rate is, um, but it's easier just to talk about percentage of, of line rate. And then it's going to send this traffic for a period of time, and it's either all gonna be received or some of it's not gonna be received. And so let's say that uh, in this example that um, the 50% of traffic was not received. So we didn't get 50% through, and so we want to understand uh, what does that mean. Um, in the structure of this test, what it means is that we should go look for a lower rate and see if we can, if we can get that to, uh, to come through. So let's say for the second test, I'm going to drop down to 25%, and based on that, let's say all the traffic does get through. So now that I know that for 64 byte packets, somewhere between 25% of line rate and 50% of line rate can be forwarded without loss. 
So then we're going to maybe pick a new number. Let's say we'll go with 40% and 40% is good. So all the traffic gets through. So now we've constrained it between 40 and 50. And I might be running out of room here, but let's just say we go to, you know, um, 47 and it's no good and 45 and it's good. And eventually we find out um, with, you know, whatever type of accuracy you want in frames per second, that, that the number in between uh, is is the, the good result for that test. And so what we've actually will have done is have found a, a no drop rate, uh, which means that for 64 byte packets that um, we can send all the traffic you know with with over 60 seconds and packets are not going to get lost in that level so that's what we want to go so that's our result for 64 bytes now we're going to move on to the next packet size and redo the same test and so here's an example of a test report. Um, I think this was a little bit, little bit old, but it was from uh, just something I found online. Um, so what it's showing is that for the 64, 128, 256, 512, on and on and on, uh, in this case, all the traffic got through. So this was back in a, in a system where every I could do line rate for all of these packet sizes. And I think the assumption at that time also was that you could also do uh, everything in between. We'll see that may not necessarily be the case in the newest high bandwidth hardware. So one of the things you may be asking yourself is, you know, why are these packet sizes special? Well, 64 is, uh, um, you know, the smallest frame on Ethernet. 128 is double that. 256, you, you see the sort of doubling. Um, you also, um, you know, have 1518, which is the largest traditional frame on Ethernet. Now we have jumbo frames that go up to, uh, to larger packet sizes. So this is what it's telling you. Now, if you were to run an RFC 2544 test today, what you're going to see is more packet sizes. Um, they're going to run, you're going to be able to say, I want to run every 16 bytes, every one byte. You can pick your, um, you, know, you can pick your, your number. And so what you're going to get is then a result which says for 64 bytes, let's say that you can do 38% of line rate or however many frames per second at 65 bytes you know, maybe you can do 38.3, 66 bytes, you do 38.7, dot, dot, dot. And eventually you'll get to some point, maybe it's, you know, 342 or whatever, that you're at like 99.9 .9, and then 343, you're at 100%. Okay. So what you've seen here is that you have these different packet forwarding rates for different packet sizes, which makes sense because I'm looking at a percentage of the total bandwidth and if one of the things I'm stressing inside the system is how many packet lookups I can do, then the larger the packets, the easier, or the fewer, P you know, the same number of PPS gets you, you know, more bandwidth. So what you'll get is, um, you know, this sort of uh, a report, and it's going to show you the capability of forwarding for all the different packet sizes. Now this is where things get a little bit tricky and, and this is kind of starting in some of the details that we'll talk a bit more in, in the next video. The systems traditionally, I would say up until about seven or eight years ago, the most challenging thing was doing packet lookups. And so a packet lookup comes in, the, the, the frame comes in to the router, we extract the packet, the system will um, take the header of the packet and usually separate it from the body of the packet. On the header, it's going to look at things like the next hop IP address. It may also look at different fields it wants to do uh, filters or QoS based on. It then compares those to the databases and um, determines where the packet needs to go next. Does it need to be dropped? Does it need to be buffered, etc. In the past, and certainly back in 1999, that was the most challenging operation in the system. We were often doing things on CPUs like Motorola 6840s or 6830s or, um, you know, uh, different types, you know, di different things that were far slower than we have today. Um, now, many more of the packet forwarding operations are done in ASICs, and so these lookups aren't nearly as challenging as they used to be. But how did things work back then? What we would tend to see is if we started at 64 byte packets, you would have some rate, we'll call this 40%. It's a good number to use. And as the packets got larger, we got up to 100%. And then at that point, we would forward any larger packets at that rate. So let's say in this example, it's 330 bytes. Okay, so at 330 bytes, that's what I call the first 
no drop rate. And the implication of the kind of assumption classically is that once we get to the first no drop rate, then that's the only no drop rate and everything else is going to go forward at line rate. This is an indication that the PPS was the limiting factor in the system. And that is still very common uh, today, but as we get into higher and higher speed ASICs, we see that's less likely the case. Uh, and that's because we want to optimize for, for other things. And also we, we, as we look at network behaviors, we see that many of the packets are, are out here. You know, some of the packets are, you know, in here, they average out to something kind of in here. And so we don't necessarily need to optimize for 200, 300 byte packets. We can optimize for bandwidth, power, things like that. Okay. So what are the packet sizes that we see today? Um, they are different in different environments, but uh, if you go back to 19... Um, 99, you tend to have lots of, it's, if, if you find information from back then, which if you actually just do a good Google search, you may find the information from back then because it's, it's a bit hard to, to, to find newer things, but they may talk about three or 400 bytes as an average packet size. What we have today is, is very different. A lot of the traffic is dominated by video, and what you have in video is lots of large packets, often 1,500 bytes, and these are going from, you know, the servers, so Netflix, uh, Max, um, YouTube, etc. And they're going to the users, whether that's a mobile device or um, your set-top box or your, your PC, whatever. And so you have these large packets going this direction, and then occasionally you have some 64-byte packets coming out in the other direction, which you're saying, yep, it's good, keep, keep sending me more. We don't have to send one of these 64 byte packets for every 15, 18 byte packet. So you do have lots of these 15, 18 byte packets. And um, I haven't seen great numbers, but I would guess that the average packet size, and when we talk about average in this context, it's really the mean packet size because the things all kind of average out. If you're thinking about your constraint being the number of PPS you can do, then if you have a 1000 byte and a 2000 byte, that's really the same as two 1500 byte packets from a PPS standpoint. Now it may not be the case from other aspects as well. So if we're doing 900 to 1100 byte packets, then the PPS, um, even though these systems are much faster than they used to be, it's no, not even close to being a challenge really. Um, if you look into data centers, often they're using uh, even larger packets because they can optimize their efficiency of moving packets between uh, their servers or their, um, their GPUs by, making, by doing larger packets. Larger packets are easier for the servers to handle. So in, a, in general, basically the, tra the trend is to much larger packets than before. And so very few routers out there uh, are going to have trouble just keeping up with the PPS load of any Real network. Okay. At the same time, let's actually take a look at what does determine the PPS capability of a, a router or of an ASIC in particular. Um, the first step is the PPS of the or the, the, the chip speed. Um, Usually these um, ASICs now are going to be maybe um, two and a half gigahertz to one and a half gigahertz. That's kind of the range that, that we're often seeing on, on medium to high end equipment. Um, they're going to be forwarding packets based on the number of, of clock cycles. And so if I have, let's say for example, let's start with an easy number. I have a chip that's one gigahertz. Um, it may have one packet coming through every clock cycle. It may have two packets coming through every clock cycle. It may have one packet coming through every two clock cycles. Um, so it is gonna be a function of the chip speed. Um, the first guess you may have is that, oh, this chip is one gigahertz and therefore it has one billion packets per second coming in. Um, that might be the case. Um, you could also have a chip that has multiple forwarding engines. So for example, let's say I have an ASIC here, but inside it, I have, well, I meant to have, let's see if I can squeeze four in there. I have four different forwarding engines. Those are all operating somewhat independently. In this case, if it's at a gigahertz, we may have four billion packets per second coming through this device. Okay. Um, there are other uh, considerations there. It might be that the device takes uh, two clocks for every 
every packet. Um, in that case, we would have it go down to two. So um, you also have different things where um, you may have a run to completion architecture like Cisco Silicon One, in which you might take you know one and a half uh, times in some of the operations. So you can um, take a little extra time. Um, you can be more efficient when you have very complicated features without having to do a full recycle, which would be um, uh, two clocks per packet. So there's different ways you can look at it, but in general, it's going to be some function of the speed of the chip, the number of the forwarding engines, and the number of um, uh, packets per, per clock. The other thing that becomes interesting, and this is really going to be the function, uh, sorry, the focus of the second part of the video, is this idea of internal bandwidth. And so once we try to make these chips more power efficient, we then need to make them higher bandwidth because putting everything into a single device is the highest power versus having multiple devices being connected with optics. There's another video in this series about that. So internal bandwidth actually becomes a constraint. And what you'll see is that as we optimize for higher power or for, for better power efficiency, what we traditionally saw in RSC 2544 didn't work. It doesn't, doesn't always hold up anymore. So what do, you, what do you actually see in 2544 when we get to the highest performing ASIC? So 6.4 terabits, 12.8 terabits, 19.2, 25.6 terabits. Um, as you get into these more uh, higher performance bot systems, what you see is something different. Um, it often will start off like this um, and may continue like this for a while, but something interesting happens at this point. And I'll leave it to you to, to take to think about what it is between now and when you maybe click on the next video. But what happens in this range isn't necessarily what you expect. And this is because of the optimizations for power efficiency, for higher bandwidth, for working in, in real networks, right? Real networks that have a, a thousand byte packets, but put a lot of, of um, uh, priority on you know higher efficiency, higher bandwidth, et cetera. So things get different over here, and that's what we'll talk about in the next video. Okay, I talked about some of this before, and I do want to kind of, again, go circle back and put some things in context. So um, we talked about you know service provider and, and data center, much larger packets today. Um, it's still interesting to look at an RFC 2544 test, especially if you look at all of the packet sizes. But it's very important not to think that a test that's automated from 1999 is what your network needs. Your network needs what your network needs. And that's a combination of your applications and your, your users and your clients. Um, almost all the routers that are in my space today, which is you know mid to high end SP and data center, um, have plenty of performance and are really differentiated on other things, whether that's um, the bandwidth they can provide in a single device, um, their, their power efficiency, whether that's how many power supplies you need to put in or how many um, uh, optics they can support or uh, you know the watts per gigabit per second. Um, optics integration is also another battleground. Um, we have optics now that are 25 or, or more watts. We have 40, or sorry, 30 watt optics on the, the near horizon with coherent 800 gig. And so supporting them is, is a big challenge and the ability to do that differentiates the, the router's um, features and scale uh, as always. Um, so the things that RFC 2544 was trying to uncover, which is the PPS limitation, aren't a big issue today. But we'll see that some of the optimizations that we do do to make the chips the highest performance will give you some things on 2544 that you may not expect. And so uh, stay tuned or go ahead and click on the next video, part two, to get some more information about that. Okay, thanks for watching the video. Um, please leave a comment and I'll be uh, looking forward to your input. Thanks.